The Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations, and Accountability will come to order. I welcome everyone to this subcommittee's first hearing titled Biden's Growing Border Crisis, Death, Drugs, and Disorder on the Northern Border. I'm honored to be chairman of this subcommittee and to be joined by our Vice Chairman Mikey Zell, our colleagues, distinguished guests, and experts. I also congratulate Ranking Member Ivey on his new role. This subcommittee is excited to get to work. I want to also thank Sang Yi and staff for the careful preparation for this hearing. Today's hearing will examine the expansion of the Biden administration's border crisis to our very critical northern border. I ask unanimous consent. Is this a gentlelady from New York attending? I ask unanimous consent uh, that the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Stefanik, is permitted to sit with the subcommittee and ask questions of the witnesses without objection, so order. I now recognize Ranking Member Ivey for the purpose of seeking unanimous consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Um, Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent that Ms. Jackson Lee and Mr. Correa be permitted to sit with the subcommittee and question today's witnesses. Without objection, so ordered. I will now make my opening statement. The subject matter of this hearing is testament to the fact that the damage from poor decisions tends to compound in unexpected ways. While the historic crisis at our southwest border warrants primary focus, the disastrous consequences of the biden Mayorkas open border policy have spread to our once secure northern border as well. While the northern border has terrainous areas, other areas, unlike the southern border, offer suburban and easy access for illegal migrant crossings. And if we could on the monitor, I'd like to show a couple of pictures of the, sec the border at uh, Derby, Vermont. This is within the Swanton sector. Can you go back to that first picture again? Yeah. So if you see the potted plants, that's, that's actually the U.S.-Canadian border in that location. And then the second picture that you see, I don't know if you can make it out, but this is what would uh, correspond to high security. They put some so wooden sawhorses along with the potted plants. So it's not exactly, uh, as you would say, a, a fortified border. And that last photo was the picture if that, that uh, if you leave it there for a moment, that same traffic circle is in the upper right-hand area uh, of the picture. And then down below to the lower left, you can see where an arrow indicates the, uh, the Customs and Border Patrol office is. They don't even have a direct line of sight to that area of the border. Uh, and so it happens that the... Um, uh, the influx of illegal aliens has multiplied rapidly in that area, is overwhelming customs and border protection, local law enforcement, and local communities. The Biden administration's failed policies emboldened criminal organizations to exploit the northern border, smuggling people, including children, drugs, and weapons, over the northern border. Sadly, since just March 10th, the Swanton sector alone, that touches on New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York's northern borders, uh, has seen 28 children all under the age of 14 crossing the northern border in extremely cold and snowy conditions. Just last week, uh, authorities busted 17 illegal aliens from Nicaragua and Guatemala in one stash house in Lisbon, Lisbon, Maine. Two of them were previously removed from the country and four previously crossed the southern border. Meanwhile, due to the crisis at the southwest border, Secretary Mayorkas surged resources away from uh, other areas critical to homeland security, including the northern border. There are now fewer than 2,000 Border Patrol agents to cover the 3,145-mile land border, more than twice the, uh, the, the, uh, the size of the southwest border in terms of geography. In 2022, Secretary Mayorkas sent over 20% of the northern border workforce to help at the southwest border. Some uh, remaining agents were tasked with remotely processing aliens in Texas. Now the administration is doing an about-face, recently detailing 25 additional officers to the overwhelmed northern border. Customs and Border Patrol morale is suffering. Agents work long hours in extreme conditions and are exposed to death, crime, and suffering. The northern border is experiencing a huge increase in illegal migrant encounters. In the Swanton sector alone, that same one I just mentioned, there has been over an 800% increase since the last fiscal year. So while the numbers are not as large in absolute terms, the, the growth is astonishing. Smugglers take advantage of aliens, leaving them in treacherous conditions, 
And just last year, an Indian family of four, including two young children, were left to freeze to death at the northern border after being abandoned by a smuggler. The influx of illegal aliens also leaves the U.S. susceptible to terrorism and crime. In the last six months, Border Patrol apprehended an illegal alien listed in the terrorist screening data set between northern border ports of entry. At ports of entry, 176 individuals in the data set have been apprehended this fiscal year at the northern border. That figure compares to just 38 at the southern border. I say just, that's probably the wrong term to use. 38 on, in that, uh, in that um, uh, terrorist screening data set at the southern border, but 176 individuals at ports of entry on that list from in the north, on the northern border. The Biden administration admits that transnational criminal organizations take advantage of the northern border terrain to traffic drugs, weapons, and illicit proceeds over the border. The current crisis is giving those organizations the green light. Enough fentanyl came over the northern border in fiscal year 22 and 23 to kill 3.4 million Americans. Federal officials estimate that they are only seizing 5 to 10 percent of all drugs smuggled across the southwest border. With far less manpower in the north, over a much larger border, including much of these uh, very rough, uh, terrainous areas, it is daunting to imagine what narcotics are coming over the northern border that we do not specifically know about. Every state is a border state, and local communities, especially on the northern border, are struggling to keep up. Local police departments along the northern border lack the resources and equipment to effectively patrol their jurisdictions, especially without the help of CBP agents who were sent to the southern border. Local businesses cannot accommodate the groups of aliens that congregate in their lobbies looking for shelter and rides to their final destinations. These communities need reprieve. President Biden's open border policies and Secretary Mayorkas's refusal to enforce our nation's laws have jeopardized national security at the U.S.-Canada border and the operational readiness of Border Patrol agents. Just two weeks ago, in front of us in McAllen, Texas, which uh, some of our fellow uh, folks on the other side of the aisle had been present, but, sec but the chief of the U.S. Border Patrol acknowledged in his testimony that uh, the, we do not have operational control of the southern border, that the southern border in many places is not secure, and that it is the consequence of Biden administration policies that both those conditions obtain. Well, same problem in different ways is manifesting itself at the northern border. We will hold Biden, President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas accountable for this metastasizing crisis. I welcome our members and appreciate the important work we will do together. I also welcome and thank our guests for joining. Thank you all. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. <clears throat> First, I would like to take a moment at the beginning of this hearing to express my deepest condolences to those affected by the devastating tornado that impacted Ranking Member Thompson's Mississippi District this past weekend. And secondly, um, I, I would certainly be remiss if I did not also acknowledge um, yet another tragic act of gun violence in our schools that left six dead in Nashville, three school children and three teachers. Uh, I, I think the contrast of the natural disasters and mass shootings that we are facing as a nation um, is pretty sharp with respect to the issue that's being brought forward before this hearing, uh, this committee today, uh, this manufactured northern border, border crisis. Um, the facts do not support the Republican claim that the northern border is, quote, uh, a source of death, drugs, and disorder. In fact, with respect to the uh, northern border crisis, I think by contrast, if I could have um, our quote, one of our fellow colleagues here on the committee has said, I'm not worried about the northern border. A and he's not alone in that statement. There are other members who've made similar statements on, well, from the Republican side of the aisle, uh, also on this committee who stated that before. Uh, but let me say this, if we're gonna be here and discuss this today, and clearly we are, I wanna make sure that everybody understands that this is not a problem that began under the Biden administration. In 2019, the GAO highlighted the Trump administration's decision to focus on the Southwest border 
which led to a significant staffing and resource challenge at the northern border. In fact, the Trump administration compounded that problem then that same year by terminating a contract with an outside contractor. I believe it was Accenture, but I'll say that's subject to check. But before they were able to actually expedite the much needed staffing increases, the Trump administration terminated that contract for convenience. As a result, CBP's numbers of apprehensions between ports of entry hit a high watermark in FY 2019 under the President Trump with 4,408 apprehensions compared to the 2,856 encounters the Border Patrol had in FY 2023. Can we have the second exhibit as well? I think this chart shows with the red being 2019, the number from uh, the year I just was discussing, the high water mark being in the Trump administration, FY22 uh, has gone up from FY21, but it's still short of the numbers we experienced in 2019, or 2018 for that matter. I, I wanna be clear about this as well. I know there's a lot of issues about the statistical uh, discussions, and we'll, we'll have more chance to discuss those at length. I think we'll have witnesses who are going to give detailed comments and explanations. But I want to make sure we're on the same page with respect to our definitions of encounters and apprehensions and arrests. Um, I, I'll come back to that in a moment. But with respect to the um, uh, major point of this hearing, I would assume, is that if we're gonna fix the problem, we have to commit resources to doing that. Um, and as I said at a previous hearing in this committee, um, this is the show me the money moment. Um, one way of measuring whether there's, uh, people are serious about addressing a problem is by looking at the budgets and the um, efforts they, they make to commit money to fix the problems. Uh, in December, uh, Democrats passed the Omnibus Appropriations Bill and as I discussed in our previous hearing back in February, um, to help DHS manage the border, um, the bill added 300 additional Border Patrol agents, 125 more CBP officers and related personnel, and more than $400 million for non-intrusive inspections uh, systems to interdict drugs. And the non-intrusive inspections are important because can Canada is our, I believe, number two trading partner. And so we don't want to delay the intercourse between the two countries uh, with excessive and extensive uh, inspections. We want to make sure that the products that between the United States and Canada can flow uh, quickly and, and, and uh, efficiently. Uh, in addition to that, though, the bill also authorized a new $800 million shelter and services grant program to improve CBP's operational capabilities and to help manage the border by reducing overcrowding in facilities. Only two Republicans currently serving in the entire House of Representatives voted for that bill, and neither of them serve on this committee. Not only have Republicans voted against this funding, they failed to put forward a workable plan or markup, any viable legislation that could actually fix this so-called crisis at the northern border. And I hope the uh, witnesses will discuss H.R. 9023 uh, which is uh, Member Tenney's bill, um, and I believe Congressman Stauber is a, a co-sponsor of that bill, but I do want to point out right now, so they'll have a chance to respond, that this bill only speaks to, um, even if we assume that the, this, the transfer of money from the IRS uh, were to actually happen, under the actual provisions of this bill, the money could only go to the southern border. So. Uh, in a possible reflection of their, their view of the importance of the northern border, it isn't even addressed in that legislation. Instead of, re of relying on uh, the Republicans, we've had to count on the Democrats to address these problems. And that continues to this day with uh, President Biden's new budget proposal, which would fund even more major investments in both the technology and facilities at the northern border. For example, the President's proposed budget would provide $66 million for the construction of a new border patrol facility in Maine, as well as devoting $38 million for a surveillance towers on both the northern and southern borders. In addition, the President's budget request includes $600 million for work, work, workforce 
pay raises and proposes the hiring of 350 more Border Patrol agents, 150 field operations officers, 175 Border Patrol processing coordinators, 244 Border Patrol mission support staff, and 46 field operations mission and operations staff. The Republicans had offered no specifics, only rhetoric. I'll leave it to my colleagues and, and the witnesses to discuss our trading relationship with, with Canada. Um, as I mentioned, it's clearly a critical relationship for the United States economy. And there's nothing going on with respect to Canada that merits them being treated like some kind of rogue state. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the Biden-Trudeau meeting, I think, uh, from last week is an indication that they're a good working partner with the United States and that we've been able to, con in the past, and will continue to be able in, in the future, to work through problems in a way that is joint and effective. Lastly, I, I want to mention that, um, on a separate note, uh, about a month ago, I sent a letter to the committee um, expressing my thoughts about additional or another type of investigation that we should be pursuing. Uh, with respect to uh, the DHS OIG, uh, there have been allegations that surfaced in the last Congress, and two, mem two chairmen at the time sent letters to the IG demanding documents on two fronts. One was with respect to allegations of sexual harassment uh, going on inside that office uh, and demanding documents in response to address that. The second was the failure of the OIG to produce or inform Congress until 14 months later that text messages with respect to January 6th had been apparently deleted. Uh, that, that issue, I've, I've thought, merited a hearing, especially since, given this committee's jurisdiction of oversight, is sort of right down the middle of the alley for where we should be looking, as opposed to a border issue when we've got a subcommittee that's focused on borders. I would renew my request to have a hearing on those issues with respect to the OIG's conduct. I think it's critical for us to get to the bottom of it. The IG role in all of these departments, as we know from the Watergate era, is critical in making sure that they function appropriately, uh, and we need to make sure that they're able to, to uh, perform that mission and are focused on doing it correctly in a thorough, objective, and transparent way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me a chance to offer my opening statement. Uh, with that, I yield back. Well, thank you, Mr. Ivey. That, uh, that letter you sent was uh, on uh, March 20th. That's eight days ago, not a month ago, but we'll certainly will take it up in due course. Um, so um, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record, I'm pleased uh, to have two distinguished panels of witnesses before us today on this very important topic. I will now introduce our first panel of witnesses, which is a member panel. Questions uh, by members on the dais will be reserved for the witnesses on the second panel after those witnesses' opening statements. Representative Claudia Tenney represents the 24th District of New York and is a member of the Northern Border Security Caucus. Representative Mike Kelly represents the 16th District of Pennsylvania, co-chair of the Northern Border Security Caucus. Representative Brian Higgins represents the 26th District of New York and is co-chair of the Northern Border Caucus. Representative Pete Stauber represents the 8th District of the great state of Minnesota and is a member of the Northern Border Security Caucus as well. I thank these members and witnesses for being here today. I'll now, now represent, uh, recognize Representative Tenney for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Bishop and uh, Ranking Member Ivey and members of the Oversight Investigations and Accountability Subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you all today and testify in the crisis at our northern border. While a lot of attention, rightfully so, has been paid to our southern border, our northern border is also facing a crisis. The U.S.-Canada border is the longest international border between two countries in the world. And I may just uh, uh, address the uh, ranking member for a moment, this manufactured crisis that he describes. Uh, maybe we could discuss why uh, President Biden recently went to Canada to visit with Prime Minister Trudeau to discuss the problems at the border. So apparently President Biden has uh, recognized that this is an issue as well. Uh, recent news reports, along with data compiled over the last two years, show a surge in illegal migrant crossings and drug trafficking across the northern border, specifically in the North Country sector of the border, which I partially represent, 
there has been nearly an 850% increase in border crossings, while the stats the ranking member shows uh, do not count this past year. As the national security threat at our northern border continues to grow exponentially, there has been no corresponding increase in U.S. Border Patrol staffing. It's still at the same level as was fiscal year 2009. I'm honored to represent New York's 24th Congressional District, which runs along the northern border with Canada, across Lake Ontario, and the St. Lawrence River. This crisis is directly harming my constituents as drugs and illegal aliens are trafficked along the border. Under President Biden's failed leadership, our borders are less secure and our communities are at risk. It is critical now more than ever for members of Congress to come together with one voice to advocate against President Biden and Secretary of Homeland Security Mayorkas's reckless policies. It's time for the administration to finally focus on delivering the resources needed for our hardworking and courageous Border Patrol agents at the northern border to do their jobs effectively. Since President Biden has taken office, there has been nearly a 15-fold increase in northern land border encounters. There were 997 border, northern border land encounters in January 2021 before President Biden took office. It's 15-fold since that date. But since then, we continue to see these crossings with no action on the part of the administration. In the month of October 2022, there were 15,938 northern land border encounters. In fiscal year 2020, there were 32,376 borders encounters. In fiscal year 2022, there were 109,535 encounters. Under the Biden administration, drug smuggling has increased by 596% along the northern border, including a 26% increase in fentanyl. Border Patrol staffing has remained flat, as I said, since 2009. Since fiscal year 2009, staffing levels along the northern border sectors have been between 1,887 and 2,263 personnel. FY 2020 northern border staffing was at 2019, actually less. The longest international border in the world, measuring 5,525 miles, the U.S. northern border, has only 115 ports of entry with no performance measures to assess, assess security between ports. This shortcoming is especially impactful to my district, which shares a considerable border with Canada across Lake Ontario. Numerous traffickers utilize this large expanse of water to bypass more heavily guarded sections of the border, funneling drugs into our communities. Others use the heavy boat traffic on the St. Lawrence in the summer to overwhelm and evade the border security there. Just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to meet with our Buffalo Border Patrol agents, and they discussed the many issues they're facing. However, by far the biggest challenge these public servants face is the lack of resources and assistance to effectively do their jobs. For example, under Secretary Mayorkas, each border sector must individually apply to receive permission to perform counter unmanned aerial systems operations. It took Secretary Mayorkas roughly three weeks to approve the Buffalo sector's uh, ability to perform to counter these CUAS operations. During this time, drug smugglers continue to use UAS to traffic fentanyl and other drugs across the border that directly harms our communities. Once again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of the committee. I'm glad to see the northern uh, border crisis finally getting the attention it needs. And may I ask the ranking member, we are happy to amend my bill to include the northern border, and I hope you'll join us in those efforts. And I do implore the committee to please join uh, with our border agents at the northern border to really understand what's happening up there. It's really a crisis and it's tragic on a human level as well. Thanks so much. I appreciate the ability to testify. Thank you, Representative Tenney. And I now represent, uh, recognize Representative Mike Kelly for five minutes for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Vice Chairman, thank you uh, for allowing us to be here today. You know, uh, look, I think it's time for us to quit playing who struck John and talk about the problem we face. Uh, and it's getting down to there's no secrets in our family. There's just a lot of things we don't talk about. Four and a half million illegals have crossed into this country since the Biden administration went into effect. There's no way you can play with that. You can't twist it. You can't turn it. You can't make it a different color. The problem we have is we have nobody guarding our borders the way we're supposed to. The northern border is wide open. Now, hear what Ms. Tenney said, 55, uh, 100 miles, 1,000 miles, right? That's a long, that's a 5,500 miles, that, that border. 
Yeah, There's no way we can cover it. Then when you take, and you'll listen to the, the Border Patrol people when they come in, you take those folks from the border, uh, from the northern border and take them down to the southwestern border because they're doing the intake, and you're looking at 40% of our Border Patrol down on the, on, the, on the border in the southwest and understand that 40% of those are working on the intake place. And, and so the, you come down today, so what is the problem? Now, Chairman, you very clearly stated what's taking place. The numbers are incredible. They're off the charts. Ms. Tenney repeated a lot of what it is that you just said. Now, we can sit here and point fingers and say, no, it was the other administration. It's not this administration. I will challenge anybody to go to the southwestern border and see who put up a fence. One is a really tall fence that you look at and say, my God, there's nobody can get over that. And the other one looks like the outfield fence of the Little League. Now, we can keep saying it wasn't us that did it. It was the other party that did it. The truth of the matter is we have serious problems at our border. Four and a half million illegal entries into our country. If they were wearing the, uh, the uniform of a foreign country, we would think we were being invaded. And we would be very, uh, say, my God, who's watching the border? And the answer is the Border Patrol, but they are so strung out. They are so purposely sent from one place to another. And this administration, by its failure to admit that we have a problem, is the problem. Now, the ranking member, I appreciate what you went through in the beginning, of it, but again, it always comes down to, no, no, not us, them. Now, you talk about pieces of legislation that control and have a, some, some information, but it gets blurred into what the total side of the legislation is. I will just say this, and please. Well, well, no, will the no, 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 yield no, I won't. Question? I won't yield right now. I will not yield. It's taken us too long to get here. We had to form the Northern Border Caucus in order to get some attention because it was being totally, dis it was just being ignored. When you hear what the Border Patrol goes through, then you can hear what those men and women on the border do. When I got to Erie and talked to those men, years before when I stopped by to see them, everything was fine. This year, you could see it on their face. They are drained. They are drained because they feel they have no help coming from this administration. Now, whether we like it or not, the truth of the matter is, look at the game films. You can't alter them. Four and a half million illegal entries into this country. That doesn't count the people that came through the right way. And just to think, for that four and a half million people, if their first action upon entering the United States was to break one of her laws, that's not somebody I want to have in my community and say, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. Come on in. If we do not address this crisis at the northern borders, if we do not look at that border that's totally un unprotected, there's just not enough men up there to do it. They are just worn out. Now, there's ways to, I guess, to address that, but a lot of that area is totally unpopulated. We don't know who's coming in or who's going out, but we do know the number of deaths. Those deaths from fentanyl are the ones that you look at and say, my God, this is somebody's son or daughter. This is somebody who we would love to have in our community, and because of this infestation, it's corrupting us. It's ruining us. It's causing us to fight them against, uh, between each other as opposed to saying, look, we got a problem at our borders. If we don't recognize that as Americans, forget about the red team and the blue team. Think about what it is that we are supposed to do. The office that we are in right now, we take an oath to protect this country. And for us to say, no, this is going to be a political battle, this is not political for me. This is about policy. And nobody can tell me that this administration has addressed this when you, can, you went completely ignored her, ignore a crisis at our southwestern border and don't even mention the, the northern border. Forget about the thing with Trudeau over the weekend. That was a joke. That's not serious. So I would just all, ask all members of Congress to please stop looking at which side of the aisle you're sitting on and start looking about what's taking place in our country right now. Four and a half million illegals since this administration went into office. Now, please, don't tell me there's not a problem and don't tell me it's being addressed because the, the, the reality of it is not being addressed, it is being ignored by the president, the vice president. They have turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to our borders. So, listen, we can, we can football this back and forth, but the reality of is America is suffering because of the inattentiveness and inactions taken by this administration. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Representative Kelly. Uh, and I now recognize Representative Higgins for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Bishop and Ranking Member Ivey for allowing me to testify today. Uh, I served on this committee for three terms, and it's good to be back. My name is Brian Higgins, and I represent Buffalo, Niagara Falls in Western New York in the House. Uh, it's good that you're having this hearing on the northern border. Uh, I would argue that Canada is not a hostile neighbor to the United States. 
Uh, we share a history that is strong. Uh, in fact, on 9-11, when the airspace in uh, the United States was shut down, 37 passenger planes landed in Gander, Newfoundland, uh, a town uh, in Canada of about 7,000 people, and there were about 7,000 people on those planes. Uh, they were treated as friends, they were treated as neighbors, and uh, they were helpful to each other. Uh, I grew up on the northern border, spent most of my summers in the Canadian shores of Lake Erie in the cottage communities of Bay Beach, uh, Crystal Beach, uh, Thunder Bay, played ice hockey uh, up in uh, Canada. Uh, we are in close proximity to the province of Ontario. <clears throat> the province of Ontario is 15 million people. It's 38% of the entire country of Canada. Uh, the Canadian economy is a little less than $2 trillion. They value worker rights, they value human rights, they value environmental rights. The American economy is about $23.5 trillion. We value the same things. Uh, my Western New York economy is deeply integrated economically with Southern Ontario. Our life qualities are integrated. We need to have a border, which has been said is 5,500 miles long with 120 land ports of entry that is safe and secure, but we cannot characterize our northern border and our northern neighbors as hostile. You know, if you look at places uh, throughout the world, uh, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, in the Indo-Pacific, um, it's surrounded by hostility and instability. We in North America are surrounded by fish and friends. And I think that we need to recognize that relationship. I think we need to celebrate it. Um, yes, with good border protection, as my colleagues have said, we need to treat our Customs and Border Protection agents as the professionals that they are. We need to make sure that they're properly supported and that they are properly compensated for the work that they do. Uh, as my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, has said, it is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that people who are hired on the northern border, who live in close proximity to it, are forced to go to the southern border. It's not good policy. It's not good practical sense because a lot of those people end up quitting. So we lose those resources altogether. So I would ask that this committee uh, recognized uh, the shared prosperity, the shared security that is so important to the United States and Canada without compromising the strong friendship that has existed between our two countries. We need each other. And uh, we have all kinds of examples of that in Buffalo and Western New York. 30% of the people that use the Buffalo Niagara International Airport originate from Canada. We have two professional sports franchises, the NFL Buffalo Bills, the NHL Buffalo Sabres. 20% of the ticket buying base, the fan base, is in Southern Ontario. Canadians spend $15 million a year in healthcare uh, in Buffalo and Western New York. It is a shared existence. We are mutually benefit from that relationship. And my hope is that this committee will recognize that the immigration issue uh, is being solved uh, as evidenced by the president and the prime minister coming up with an agreement about better management. Uh, those diplomatic engagements need to continue to ensure that there is safety and security uh, at the border. But let's not compromise uh, our relationship with our northern neighbors who have been good neighbors, who are contributors, net contributors to our economy and uh, our life quality. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative Higgins. And I'm, I'm moved to agree with you that, uh, and, and uh, say for the record, that uh, the relationship with our neighbor in uh, Canada is uh, in, an entirely important one, and, uh, and, uh, and their friends, not anything other than that. Both countries benefit from an orderly and secure border, of course. And I think your testimony illustrates that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, if you take the example that you mentioned of the agreement entered into last week by, between the President and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, though, it was an example of a safe third country agreement. 
Canada can return migrants who are passing through the United States into Canada. They get to return them. And their exchange for that was they would accept 15,000, frankly, if you consider our numbers, 15,000 migrants from the Western Hemisphere, it's a, it's a, it's a rounding error. Uh, and, and, and the kind of th safe third agreement that has now, it will now benefit Canada, obviously they don't think the United States is hostile enemy either, we're friends, but they believe, they see the value in that. Those safe third agreements that the United States had with countries to our South have been allowed to lapse and abandoned by this administration. And what Canada's pursuing, we should pursue on behalf of the United States. So with that, I uh, uh, recognize, thank you, Representative well, Higgins, and I now recognize Representative well, Stauber for Mr. five Mr. minutes. Mr. Chairman, would, his, would you yield so I could have a chance? I, you'll have a comment. chance in a little bit when you have question time, sir, but uh, at this moment, I will uh, recognize Representative Stauber for five minutes. I, I would only ask that we be able to have equal time as we go forward, Mr. Chairman. Representative Stauber, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Higgins, I, I appreciate you mentioned the Buffalo Sabres because my younger brother was a goaltender there for a few years. and. Uh, my brother Rob Stauber, he played with Los Angeles and Buffalo, so um, I appreciate you mentioned professional hockey. Uh, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Ivy, and members of the committee, I would like to thank you for convening this very important hearing, as well as for allowing me the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the people of northern Minnesota. I am proud to represent Minnesota's 8th Congressional District, which contains a large portion of Minnesota's nearly 550-mile-long border with Canada including important crossings like the Northwest Angle, Grand Portage, and International Falls. Throughout the 8th District, uh, throughout the 8th District, cross-border traffic, commerce, recreation, and tourism play an incredibly important role. However, rather than benefiting the lives of my constituents, the, the proximity to our unsecured northern border with Canada is increasingly becoming a liability. As the effects of the Biden administration's disastrous immigration and border security policies become a part of my constituents' everyday lives. As this administration fails to properly address our growing crisis at our southern border, the consequences are echoing throughout communities across the United States, particularly in our northern border communities. As I visit with hardworking, <clears throat> excuse me, as I visit with hardworking Custom and Border Patrol Protection agents in my district, I hear their concerns about staffing levels and the lack of focus to the north. According to agency data, uh, CBP staffing levels along our northern border have remained stagnant over the past decade, even as threats have increased. Agents in my district are being pulled away from their patrols, either being dispatched to patrol or southern border, or being relegated to sit in their offices to process paperwork related to illegal crossings at the southern border. On average, there is now only one officer on duty for every 275 miles of the border in my district. Every minute that these officers' attention is focused elsewhere, we are leaving our northern border vulnerable to illicit activity, whether it be illegal crossings by individuals or trafficking of dangerous drugs. Drug smugglers are human trafficker and human traffickers are taking notice of the lack of the enforcement and growing vulnerability at the northern border and are using it to their advantage. As some of my colleagues have shared, drug trafficking along the northern border is increasingly exponentially. According to Customs and Border Protection data, drug smuggling across the northern border has increased by nearly 600% since fiscal year 2021. These drugs are pouring over the northern border and flowing directly into our communities, killing our citizens. The communities in my district are being ravaged by the influx of uh, lethal fentanyl. Today, fentanyl is the leading cause of death among adults in the United States, taking more lives each year than car accidents, suicide, heart disease, or cancer. In 2021, nearly 1,300 Minnesotans died of fentanyl overdose, a staggering 22% increase just from the previous year. Just last week, law enforcement officials in Hennepin County, Minnesota, charged six individuals for possession of 34 pounds of fentanyl. 14 pounds of methamphetamine, and nearly two pounds of cocaine. As many of us in this room have unfortunately learned in recent years, it takes only two milligrams of fentanyl to kill an adult. Last week's seizure, those 34 pounds of fentanyl would have been enough to kill 7.8 million individuals, or enough to kill every Minnesotan nearly 1.5 times over. During my 23 years working as a law enforcement officer in Duluth, Minnesota, I worked tirelessly to keep illegal drugs off the streets and out of the hands of our young children. You do not know the pain until you have to give a death notification to an unsuspecting parent, as I have had to do 
way too many times. The drug crisis in this country has grown out of control, taking the lives of countless Americans from all walks of life each and every day. We will never be able to overcome this epidemic until we address the nation's poorest borders and stop the flow of these drugs into our country. Over Memorial Day weekend 2022, resort owners along the border in my district encountered individuals trying to cross the northern border illegally by boat. When the resort owners went to call Customs and Border Patrol, no one answered their call. In fact, the voicemail said they were closed through the holiday. Unfortunately, illegal immigrants do not observe federal holidays, and five illegal immigrants escaped into our country. This is just one of countless examples. In fiscal year 2022, we saw nearly 110 apprehensions of illegal immigrants across our entire northern border. So far this year, we are on track to see well over 150,000 apprehensions according to the latest CBP data. In Minnesota, we are currently on track to see the number of apprehensions double year over year. And keep in mind, these numbers only reflect the ones who got caught. As members of Congress, we have a duty to deliver results for the American people. The crisis at our southern border and increasingly the growing threat at our northern border is affecting the lives of Americans across the United States. We must act. Accordingly, I want to thank the members of the Homeland Security Committee for taking on this issue. I stand ready to work with each of you to push back against the Biden administration's disastrous open border policies and once and for all address our growing dual border crisis. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stauber. Thank you again to each of the members for participating in the first uh, panel and for your valuable testimony. The witnesses are dismissed and the subcommittee will stand in brief recess while the clerks arrange for the second panel of witnesses. The committee will again come to order, please. I'm pleased to welcome our second panel of witnesses, uh, and I ask at this time that the witnesses please rise and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Com Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. And uh, I will now introduce our second panel of witnesses. Mr. Brandon Judd is the president of the National Border Patrol Council. Mr. Robert Quinn is the commissioner of the Department of Safety for the state of New Hampshire. Uh, Dr. Laura Dawson is the executive director of the Future Borders Coalition. And Mr. Andrew Arthur is 
resident fellow in law and policy for the Center for Immigration Studies and a former immigration judge. Thank you to each of you for being here today. And I now recognize Mr. Judd for five minutes for his opening statement. Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Ivey, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to testify before you on behalf of my membership. I want to give a, a little perspective. Um, the National Border Patrol Council, we, we boast the highest rate of organized membership of any other union in the entire federal government. 90% of Border Patrol agents are voluntary members of the National Border Patrol Council whereas the federal government as a whole is somewhere around 45% organized. We represent to the best of our abilities exactly what the agents would have us tell you today. Um, what we have seen in my 25 years of experience, eight of those years have been spent on the northern border, three in, in Maine and five in Montana. What we are currently seeing is something that we never dreamed would have ever happened. Um, when you look at the total numbers back in 2019, 2018, we did reach a high water mark, but that was in the best of times. We had more agents in the field than we ever had in, in the history. So, of course, we're going to apprehend more people when you have more people in the field. Um, but then you look at what we currently experience and what we have experienced in the past. When, when we look at what, what we deal with and we face on the northern border, you can't quantify the unknown. In fact, when I was stationed in Montana, there was a Canadian rancher who noticed that there were new trails that were going through his land. So what he did was he set up game cams to try to figure out what was going on. He actually captured right on the Canadian US border, he captured a vehicle that pulled up and picked up several people that, that crossed the border illegally. He turned the, the footage over to the RCMP. The RCMP then turned it over to HSI. HSI did an investigation and they determined that an organization believed to be the Gulf Cartel operating out of Texas was making regular trips up to the northern border and were picking up it to Montana specifically on a regular basis. They were, they were making these trips and they were picking up people um, illegally. This was a complete and total unknown and it had been taking place for years. So we have no idea how many people actually entered the country illegally. Then of course you have to look at what just happened north of Minnesota, right, right there on the Minnesota, uh, North Dakota border. When you had four Indian nationals who perished due to the weather and they were, they were intending to cross the border illegally. In fact, we would not have even known that they were there if it wasn't for the people that did enter the country illegally and then called 911. If it wasn't for that, we would, have, we would have had no idea. So when you look at that, the unknown just can't be quantified. But what we do know is that it's very scary. When, you look at, when I look at my time on the northern border, I'm only aware of three groups in the state of Maine that were apprehended that actually crossed the border illegally. There were countless number of, of incursions that actually got away, but only three that I'm aware of that we actually detected and apprehended. And that's simply because we don't have the manpower or the resources that are necessary. When you look right now, we are deploying one agent for about every 30 miles. It's impossible to patrol the border. It's impossible to think that Border Patrol agents would be able to patrol the border when, when you're responsible for, for 30 miles for one agent. Your nearest backup could be as far as an hour away. There was a time that I was deployed to the field that I was the only agent that was responsible for nearly 60 miles of border. It is impossible. It's also impossible to know what's crossing when you have gaps in that coverage. So when we look at, uh, when we look at, at the number of apprehensions and we're, doing, and, and we're apprehending those people with the fewest number of agents in the field that we've, that we've ever had, um, that is a, is a scary prospect, especially where they're, where they're currently coming in. When we look at all the technology and the resources, we can throw as much technology as we want at this issue, but if we do not have the manpower in the field, we will not be able to detect and apprehend these people. We must do everything that we can to retain agents. You can give me as many ground sensors, you can give me as many aerostats, 
as you, as you possibly want. But if I do not have the agents in the field to detect and apprehend these people, the only thing those aerostats and the ground sensors will be doing is they will be counting our gotaways, nothing more. It is very important that we look at this issue, look at what we can do to solve this problem, and implement those, those solutions. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Judd and Mr. Quinn. You're now recognized for your five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Robert Quinn. I'm the Commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Safety, which oversees the New Hampshire divisions of State Police and Homeland Security. By way of background, I was a sworn law enforcement officer for 30 years with the New Hampshire State Police, culminating as the Colonel before eventually becoming Commissioner of the Department. I've been invited here today to testify about New Hampshire's recent efforts to augment and support the humanitarian crisis that appears to be building along the Canadian border in our neighboring states. New Hampshire shares an international border with Canada that is over 50 miles long and lies within what is known as the U.S. Border Patrol's Swanton Sector. The Swanton Sector includes the border area contain containing New Hampshire, Vermont, and a small portion of New York. Just this past Friday, I had the fortune of touring our northern border in New Hampshire and meeting some of the excellent state, local, and federal law enforcement officers who work along the border. New Hampshire is unique in that the vast majority of our border consists of state forest land accessible through one main road and an intricate system of forest roads built for logging companies and snowmobile and ATV enthusiasts. Many of these roads are not on GPS maps, touch the northern border, and can only be traversed by off-road vehicles. In the winter, the terrain is cold, snowbound, and difficult to travel using conventional vehicles. I learned on Friday that Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, which is the town along the border, is the largest town by area in New England with 281.3 square miles to vast mountainous terrain and overseen by a part-time chief and one part-time officer. Just for perspective, I was told it takes over an hour to reach the closest hospital to the border. As with most more than border states, travel times can greatly increase based on local weather conditions. On January 25th, 2023, the U.S. Border Patrol announced that the Swanton sector witnessed a 743% increase in apprehensions and encounters in the first quarter of the federal fiscal year 2023, when compared to the same period a year ago. Apprehensions and encounters from October to December increased from 136 in 2021 to 1,146 in 2022, exceeding the 1,065 apprehensions and encounters for all of 2021. As of early March 2023, the total number of apprehensions in this area was 2,227. While this amount appears small in comparison to numbers experienced at the southern border, this is a large and unexpected increase for a very remote area of the country with few resources available to address. To be clear, although New Hampshire has seen an increase in crossings, we have not seen the large increases that Vermont is presently experiencing. However, as more resources focus on the Vermont border, I believe it's only a matter of time for New Hampshire to experience the same or similar increases. During my recent visit to the border, I met with the state police troop commander who was responsible for patrolling the North Country. He indicated that it is important to be aware that many non-citizen migrants are victims of human trafficking. During my conversations with the local police chief and residents, I learned that many are generally nervous due to reports of increased activity and significant drug seizures in recent years. I spoke with an individual who was concerned and nervous when she returns home from after work that increased border crossings will result in individuals trespassing on her property. New Hampshire is not waiting for the crisis to cause further impact to our state. Without complete operational control at the northern border in New Hampshire, we learned our residents are at increased risk. Under the leadership of Governor Chris Sununa, our state started taking steps to address the crisis in January. As I understand from the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office, the United States Supreme Court has placed constitutional limits on what types of border protection laws they can enact on their own. However, under existing federal law, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has the ability to deputize state and local law enforcement officers with the authority to enforce federal immigration laws by entering into an agreement under USC 1357G, sometimes referred to as a Section 287 agreement or an ICE delegation agreement. From, from our perspective, it's critical that Homeland Security delegate its authority to our state police to detain and apprehend those who are crossing the border illegally into our state. We learned, we started the process to obtain such a delegation back in early February, culminating with a letter dated February 17, 2023, in which we formally requested that the federal government delegate its authority to enforce federal border security laws. On that same day, we received a response explaining no agreement could be entered into due to a national freeze 
on all delegation agreements, and then no one-off custom agreements were authorized either. Unfortunately, two days later, we received word that a migrant passed away while attempting to cross the border in the Swanton sector. Although that occurred in Vermont, we certainly want to use every public safety resource available we can to prevent this from happening in New Hampshire. Our troopers are accustomed to having presence along the border and are among the most professional and dedicated law enforcement officials in the country. And since they have experience along the border, I believe it would be seamless for them to augment and support the border security effort through a delegation. After we received a denial from Homeland Security at the regional level, Governor Sununu who spoke with Homeland Security Director Mayorkas about this and sent a letter directly to him, asking his department to enter into such an agreement. To date, Homeland Security has not granted our state a delegation agreement, and no one from the department has reached out to any state officials to begin drafting such an agreement. There is one other request that we have made to the Department of Homeland Security that has also not been addressed. Since approximately 2011, the state police have assisted in patrolling the northern border through a grant funded by FEMA, another state agency within the Department of Homeland Security, by participating in Mr. what is... Mr. Quinn, your, your time has expired. If you could wrap up in just a little bit, I'd appreciate it. So in this last request, uh, in, our, in our request, we asked for $337,000 to fund Operation Stone Garden, we're appropriated 180,000, not allowing for um, more patrols and three ATVs. So we would respectfully request that um, these two requests be honored. Thank you, Mr. Quinn, Thank I you. appreciate that. Now I recognize Dr. Dawson for her five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Ivey, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Laura Dawson, and I'm the executive director of the Future Borders Coalition, which is a U.S.-Canada organization dedicated to better borders for travel and trade. The northern border is a vital gateway for U.S. prosperity and jobs. Our two countries, as you've heard, boast the longest international border spanning 5,525 miles, uh, alongside 13 U.S. states and eight Canadian provinces and territories. Every day, 400,000 people and $2 billion in trade cross that border, and the vast majority of those crossings are problem-free. On the trade side, Canada is the largest customer for 30 U.S. states. Canadians buy more than $30 billion worth of American goods annually. That's more than the U.K., Japan, and Germany combined. On travel, Canada is the largest, uh, is, Canada is the United States' largest source of tourism revenue. At approximately $20 billion a year, tourist services are a top export to Canada. Adding new impediments to cross the border hurts Americans, especially in vulnerable northern, northern border communities, such as Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is about half a mile from where I was born. So before we start piling on new barriers, we must have a realistic view of the risks. We have been hearing a lot about multi-thousand percent increases in CBP encounters on the US-Canada border. These numbers will get your attention to be sure, but the data presented compares the present day with early 2021 when borders were all but closed for COVID. Of course, we're gonna see a much busier border nowadays. And what do we mean by encounters? It turns out these can be anything from an irregular migration crossing to someone who forgets to bring their passport to the border. Clearly, the risks we should be worried about are people crossing between official border posts. Of the 165,000 northern border encounters reported by CBP since the start of fiscal year 2022, only 2.7 percent, I repeat, 2.7 percent, have occurred between official border points of entry. In absolute terms, we're talking about approximately 4,500 people. Now, this is not nothing, and Canada and the United States must work together to bring these numbers down. But to give you a sense of proportion, between October 1st, 2022 and February 28th, 2023, just 0.5%, that's one half of 1% of Border Patrol encounters outside of normal ports of entry occurred along the northern border. So what does a secure and efficient U.S.-Canada border look like? Well, on immigration, we have to remember that Canada is a sovereign nation, so it will have different immigration rules from those of the U.S. These are not necessarily looser or easier, they're just different. 
For example, Canada uses employment skills as a deciding factor for immigrant applications. Canada also welcomes temporary foreign workers to do specific jobs for time-limited periods, periods. Their work authorization is not connected to citizenship. Canada and the United States have a long history of working together, such as last week's amendments to the Safe Third Country Agreement, which will stem the tide of asylum seekers uh, crossing into Canada at non-border posts. This is also a great example of Canada and the US working together on a really challenging treaty issue where they were able to make progress in heroic time. Both countries also have a role to support stability in Latin America and the Caribbean, thereby ensuring that the burden does not rest on the US alone. On the law enforcement, one of the great strengths of the US-Canada relationship is that officials speak to each other each and every day. There are also formal me mechanisms for collaboration, such as the Ship Rider Program and the Cross-Border Crime Forum. Compared to what most countries are dealing with, the US-Canada border is the envy of the world, but there's always room for improvement. Here are some suggestions where investment should be sustained or increased, and I agree with Mr. Judd that we do need more investment in our border patrol and border personnel. Sufficient staffing means that trusted traders can sail through designated corridors without excessive wait, wait times, and bad actors can be more easily identified and dealt with. Pre-clearance and trusted traveler programs filter out those who mean us harm and prevents them from reaching US soil. Infrastructure modernization means that bridges, tunnels, roads, and rail crossings can meet volume demands and are resilient in the face of climate challenges and cyber attacks. With technologies like facial biometrics, officials don't have to make on-the-spot judgments about who to admit. With the right technology, officers can, can confirm admissibility using data collected and verified before the person or vehicle reaches the border crossing. The secure and prosperous US-Canada border is unique in the world, and it cannot be taken for granted. It is both a shared benefit and a shared responsibility for our two nations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. I now recognize Mr. Arthur for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Ivey, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting he me here today to discuss these important and increasingly topical, topical issues. I'm sorry about that. Uh, CBP encounters the total of aliens deemed inadmissible at the ports of entry, plus aliens apprehended between those ports, as the ranking member noted, at the U.S. border have surged under the Biden administration from just over 27,000 CBP encounters at the northern border in FY 2021. Encounters swelled to more than 109,000 aliens in FY 2022, and CBP is on pace for more than 165,000 northern uh, border alien encounters in FY 2023. The majority of those encounters, again, as the ranking member noted, have involved aliens at the ports, where the demographics are changing quickly. Whereas most, 60% of the aliens deemed inadmissible at those ports in FY 2021 were Canadian nationals, likely aliens inadmissible on criminal and other grounds, more than 77% of the aliens stopped at the northern U.S. ports this fiscal year came from somewhere else, including nearly 16,000 uh, Indian nationals, but most troubling, more than 27,000 nationals of other countries. Those are countries that aren't included in DHS's list of 21 top migrant sending countries. Border patrol apprehensions, again, as the ranking member noted, are at the northern border are lower than port encounters, but the figures are still high and rising. Northern border apprehensions increased 144% between FY 2021 and FY 2022 to more than 2,200 and are nearing 3,000 in just the first five months of FY 2023, on track to top 6,800 this fiscal year. Just 44 of those illegal entrants have been Canadians, while more than 1,600 are Mexican nationals, likely aliens who exploited visa-free travel to Canada to cross the northern border illegally, where they're all but guaranteed not to be expelled under Title 42. Credible reports, uh, including some from the federal government, reveal that cartel members and transnational criminal organizations are operating across the northern border, smuggling guns, uh, drugs, guns, and migrants. They're able to exploit an already understaffed border patrol which has been further weakened, as the chairman noted, as agents were stripped from the northern border and sent to deal with the chaos at the southwest border. And, in a twist, a surge of third country aliens, including migrants released after apprehension at the southwest border, have flooded into Canada. 
seeking the generous benefits offered to asylum applicants there. That has strained both federal and provincial governments north of the border, and to stem that surge, the Trudeau government has renegotiated a 2004 agreement between that country and the United States that limits asylum claims by third country aliens crossing the northern border. As amended, that agreement now applies to illegal entrants as well, not just aliens at the ports as in the past, a move that benefits Canada to the detriment of the United States. More than 40,000 third country migrants claimed asylum in Canada at just one entry point last year. Under this amendment, nearly all such entrants from this point forward will be sent back to the United States. This move is a tacit admission by the Biden administration that its catch and release policies at the southwest border, which a federal judge just determined this month are driving the uh, migrant surge there, are harming Canada's security and its taxpayers. To address the national security and humanitarian disaster at the southwest border, the administration should extend a similar courtesy to our overworked agents and state governments nationwide that are straining under a massive increase in newly released migrants. President Biden inherited what his first Border Patrol chief described as, quote, arguably the most effective border security in our nation's history, close quote, which he squandered as, quote, common sense border security recommendations from experienced career professionals were ignored and stymied by inexperienced political appointees, close quote. The effects of that erosion and border security are being felt in towns and cities nationwide. Drug poisoning deaths are hitting new records. Cities as big and rich as New York are scrambling to provide for newly arrived migrants and our national security is increasingly imperiled. Never in my 31 years of involvement in immigration, including at some of the highest levels of government, have I ever seen our borders in such dire shape. The catastrophe at the southwest border is now exacerbating and driving a smaller but increasingly significant disaster at our northern border, where the number of migrant deaths is growing as apprehensions on both sides of the border swell. For the good of the United States and of our partner in Canada, uh, with whom we are each other's largest exporting countries, Congress must act. Action is already overdue. I thank you again. And I look forward to your questions. In the last couple seconds I have left, Mr. Bishop, I do want to make an interesting uh, notation. Uh, the ranking member, Mr. Ivey, represents the 4th District of Maryland. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Henry Stockbridge, who was one of your predecessors in that role, actually left Congress so he could become the Immigration Commissioner at the Port of Baltimore. Uh, and under uh, Commissioner Stockbridge, many of my uh, relatives, many of uh, the relatives of my friends came into our country. I thank uh, you. I thank the 4th District of Maryland. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Arthur, for connecting it up, for con connecting us all together there, too. Uh, uh, members will be recognized in order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. Uh, an additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Uh, Mr. Judd, uh, we know that the Biden border crisis has forced Border Patrol agents to detail and retask agents from the northern border to the southern border uh, to deal with the massive influx of people there. And you've stated recently that agents on the northern border were asked to deploy to Florida to deal with the surge of illegal migrants there as well. Your testimony also referenced a uh, mere 450 agents on duty at any one time to cover this 5,500 miles of land and water border with Canada. Um, can you describe the impact on, uh, on the, of the administration's robbing Peter to pay Paul approach to border security and then what that's done to the jobs and, and uh, circumstances at the North? Certainly, when you currently look at, at the, the staffing levels right now, we have a, not only are we not deploying as many agents to the field as what we have in the past, we also have a staffing model that is just completely and totally antiquated. When you look at, we have one a, I'm sorry, one supervisor to every two agents. That's just not. Uh, it's not something that we can actually deploy agents to the field to actually do the job. Then on top of that, when you pull more agents out of the field, what it does is it requires agents to patrol an area that is just not patrollable with just one single agent. Again, you cannot control an area if you are if you are deploying an agent to patrol for every every 30 miles. That agent is responsible for 30 miles. It's impossible. 
um, to do that, and it's impossible to detect, and it's impossible to quantify how many people are crossing when you do that. So I fully agree that we need to not rob resources from a particular place in the border to go elsewhere, but then the ranking member's opening statement suggested that the issue is Republicans won't support enough resources. But it seems to me that is in general, with respect to the open borders policy the Biden administration has pursued, the way they've converted everything into processing people into the country faster, if we do, if we apply more resources in general, we're just going to process people into the country faster. And it's not going to secure the border or bring, make it more orderly. But what do you say about that? No, that's, that's absolutely correct. And when you look at uh, what he's proposed, um, 300 new agents, that's a drop in the bucket, especially when we're losing agents at a 6.8% attrition rate right now. Well, again, it's just absolutely unsustainable. We cannot send agents from the northern border to the southwest border and expect to keep um, control of the northern border. Thank you, Mr. Judd. Mr. Arthur, uh, you made reference to what you referred to as visa-free uh, visa travel from, for Mexican nationals. I, what was interesting to me to learn is notwithstanding the, the, the flood that we have across the southwest border, about which we've done lots of hearings and had lots of, heard lots of information, uh, that the largest group of folks who are encountered in the, at the northern border now are Mex, uh, Mexican nationals. You, and you talked about all the different countries. You said visa-free travel. Explain that a bit. How does that work? Why, why are people from Mexico entering through the northern border from Canada? Yeah, so we actually have visa-free uh, travel into the United States from a number of countries uh, all around the world. And as most of you know, if you travel on a U.S. passport, you generally don't need to get a visa to go to most countries. Uh, back in 2016, uh, it, Mexico and the Trudeau government reached an agreement that would allow Mexicans to enter Canada without first obtaining a visa to go to that country. And looking at these numbers, looking at the trends, it would appear that a number of those individuals are exploiting, a number of Mexican nationals are exploiting that loophole. I think 89.7% uh, of all Mexican nationals were expelled under Title 42, 8.25 at the southwest border. At the northern border, it was about 8.25%. So the odds are a lot better getting into the United States if you come over that way, so even if you get caught. So presumably, they get on a plane in Mexico, fly to maybe Montreal, and then come across the border. Is that right? Yeah. In fact, in my uh, written testimony, I note the fact that there are three nonstop flights uh, uh, to uh, Montreal every day, YUL, uh, from Mexico City. You know, um, recently in that case the decided in the Florida United States District Court, Judge Weatherill said... Uh, that Biden administration migrant release policies were, quote, akin to posting a flashing come in, we're open sign on the southern border. Uh, is the same effect being had on the northern border? Well, it, it's interesting because at the northern border, the, we, we don't know what the release numbers are up there. Uh, CBP only quantifies them. But given how broad the border is, given how few agents that we have, the opportunities to enter illegally and not be caught are much higher. I'd love to know what the Godaway numbers are at the northern border if they're not published. One of the interesting figures in the, in the staff's memo was this fact that, that so far in fiscal year 2023, the Office of Field Operations that operates ports of entry has encountered 176 individuals in the terrorist screening data set at the northern border. How about that? That seems to me to be, I mean, that's even more than encountered on the southern border, and I understand that's sort of a repeating circumstance, but that seems, you don't need that many terrorists to enter the country to cause spectacular harm. No, and in fact, in my written testimony, I talk about uh, one such uh, foreign national who entered the United States, Ahmed Rassam. His plan was to uh, blow up Los Angeles International Airport in the millennium. He was apprehended December 14th, 1999. Uh, but yeah, it, it is interesting because a great deal of attention has been paid to uh, people on the terrorist watch list being apprehended at the southwest border. When you look at those northern border port numbers, they're sky high. Uh, th that is definitely a source of concern. Again, Canada and the United States, good partners. Canada does a very good job, certainly today, uh, defending itself and defending the United States from uh, terrorist incursion. We can't make it any easier for terrorists to get into this country. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. And I now recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Ivey, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Judd, let me start with you. Um, I believe on page three of your testimony, you talk about the need for um, recruitment and retention of agents. Uh, and the challenge of lacking pay parity. Um, would it make sense for uh, additional funds to be made available to 
you and your agents uh, so that you can recruit and retain more agents so they can do the work? It's uh, vitally important. All right. And then with respect to the, um, the funding, I, you mentioned in the paragraph just above that um, that there was an increase of, of 2,700. I guess this is a proposal um, that will re require uh, two challenges. One is to uh, uh, have and recruit more agents, uh, but that entails having additional funding to recruit them, right? It does, yes. Yeah, and, and in fact, right now there's a national competition for agents, police officers, and the like. There's shortages everywhere across the country, so there's uh, competition based in part on increasing salaries and then sometimes offering bonuses for people to sign up so we can attract them. Isn't that That's correct? Right. All right. So having additional funding for recruiting and retaining officers would be important. It, it would. In fact, I, I submitted that to DHS and I n heard nothing back from DHS. Man, what we saw was anything what we were hoping for in any budget request from, from this administration. All right. You mean the new budget? Yes. Okay. So additional funding on top of that would be important and useful. Absolutely. All right. And so you would ask Congress to provide additional funding potentially to help address that need? Absolutely. All right. Uh, and then um, let me ask uh, Mr. Stauber. Actually, I guess I can ask both of you. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Judd and Mr. Quinn. Uh, you both testified about the length of the border. I guess, Mr. Judd, you talked about it more. Mr. Quinn, you mentioned that you have a shorter uh, border with Canada from New Hampshire. But with respect to you, Mr. Uh, Judd, you mentioned that, what is it, 5,500 plus miles of border? Yes. yes, sir. All right, and then while you were working on the border, I think you said you had to cover, was it 275 miles of border by yourself? N no, sir. I had to, the, the most that I ever covered at one, in one time was 60 miles. 60 miles, okay. Uh, is that bigger than it should be from your perspective? It's to, to properly patrol the border on the northern border with, with the, as little technology as we have, you would need one agent for every three to five miles. Um, one agent to every 30 to 60 miles just isn't going to do it. All right. So increasing the number of agents would be helpful, even Absolutely. if we don't get to one per three miles. Absolutely. More agents would be helpful. Yes, sir. And more, addition, more funding so that we can hire more agents would yes, be sir. necessary Absolutely. for that Absolutely. to happen. Um, and then Commissioner Quinn, let me ask you, about Operation Stone Garden. This is a, a FEMA funded um, or managed program? Yes, sir, started in 2011, Operation Stone Garden. Okay, and you mentioned in your testimony that um, uh, I guess there was a, a request, I don't know if it was just by you, but an, an effort to get additional funding for Operation Stone Garden? Yes, and those funds go to um, a collaborative local, um, state, county officers that work together along the border to support CBP. Okay, and the additional funding would be useful so that maybe you could hire more officers and, and do more to cover these, uh, the border as well? Well, actually the funding would be for more patrols and uh, specifically three all-terrain vehicles. That's what we had requested and um, was denied. All right, all right. So more funding would be helpful. Yes, sir. All right. With respect to um, Representative Tenney's comments at the end of her testimony. She invited me to join in, to, in co-sponsoring her bill, which is uh, HR 9023. Um, and the reason I pointed out is problematic, and apparently she agrees, is it only references the southern border. But the additional problem I have with the bill and the reason I wouldn't co-sponsor it at this point is it, it contains no funding source. So it calls for um, increasing salaries and expenses for new agents and officers, uh, but it doesn't talk about how to pay for that other than the monopoly money approach of trying to get it from the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which I think we all know isn't gonna happen. So uh, I, I would join with your calls and the previous panel's calls to get additional funding, stop paying, playing games with the issue about who struck John or who caused it first. Uh, and I, that's fine, we can, we can do that for purposes of this hearing, but uh, if we're going to be serious about it, and Mr. Judd and Mr. Quinn, I think your testimony reflects that, as does uh, some of the other information we presented, a lot more funding is going to be necessary. And I'm calling on my Republican colleagues 
to come up with proposals to do that. So with that, I yield back, Your Honor, uh, Mr. <laughs> Your Honor, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I can tell where you've been, sir. Flashback. I have, have the same uh, predilection. I thank the uh, ranking member, and uh, I now recognize the gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Green, for her five minutes of question. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think funding is extremely important for our programs, especially when it comes to securing the border. And um, I would like to address, address the funding issue and the, the ranking minority member on the committee that, that failed to discuss this with Representative Claudia Tenney, who's not even here on the panel, to talk about her bill and defend her bill that he was saying he refused to co-sponsor. You know, unfortunately, many of the bills that were funded during the last Congress uh, funded trillions of dollars into programs that made no sense. I'll just give you an example. An infrastructure bill that less than 10% actually went towards infrastructure. But I digress. Let's get back to the northern border. I'm from Georgia, so I don't know much about it because I live in a southern state. But I'm impressed with the fact that it has 5,525 miles, and nearly half of that is over water. Um, I was also extremely concerned to find out that before, uh, in the past 10 years, there were approximately 2,000 Border Patrol agents to cover that gigantic expanse of land. Um, I also am very concerned to find out that DHS moved more than 20% of northern border officers to have to go process the gigantic influx of illegal aliens at the southern border, uh, leaving northern border states to have to handle these problems on their own, a major problem. Um, and that comes from lack of funding from the Biden administration in the last two years when they had full control in the House and the Senate. I'd also like to point out that it's extremely concerning and, and dangerous to the United States of America's national security that Canada's immigration policy allows Mexicans to travel to Canada without a visa. It seems that Canada wants to participate in, in Mexico's invasion of the United States because many of these Mexicans are obtaining an electronic travel uh, authorization to fly into Canada and they get that approved within minutes, and then they end up coming into the United States. Uh, one state in particular, uh, Mr. Quinn, you you come from. You're, you're from New Hampshire, and I'm amazed that you have a population in your state of approximately 1.4 million people, but yet thinking about nearly 5 million illegal aliens that have attempted to come to the United States, that has to be uh, pretty intimidating. Mr. Quinn, it was reported that in 2022, a family of four Indian nationals, including two children, died of exposure to the extreme cold in Canada near your border with the U.S. on their way to enter the U.S. illegally. In December of last year, a Haitian man was found dead in the woods trying to enter the U.S. illegally from Canada. And in just February of this year, a Mexican man entering the United States illegally from Canada died during the trek. In your experience, Mr. Quinn, of being from a northern border state, what type of environments do those who attempt to cross the northern border illegally usually face during the winter months? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Those elements could be harsh and unforgiving. And just to be clear, I'm, I don't work at the northern border, but I spend time with those that do. And... Um, there's limited and often no cell coverage in some areas. And um, if you don't um, know where you're going, you can succumb to, to, the, uh, to the weather very quickly. So it is quite dangerous. So it's, it's very dangerous to people's uh, basic needs and, and survival. Mr. Quinn, the 287G program gives local law enforcement officers the authority to enforce immigration laws. It has been vilified by advocates including the ACLU and the Biden administration, has not have approved an application for the 287G program since 2021. As you note in your testimony, this includes the New Hampshire State Police's request to participate, which was recently rejected. As Commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Safety, can you please describe the value local law enforcement, such as the New Hampshire State Police, can bring to this border crisis if they were only authorized uh, to detain and apprehend those that are illegally crossing the border and, and dying on the way? Yes, it's critical. And our governor has um, requested and asked twice 
um, for the uh, delegation agreement. And just, just to be clear, our troopers can be working alone up there on that border. And what we want, we cannot enforce federal law, so we are just looking for this delegation so that we can act and, and take measures if they do come across those that are crossing in these remote areas. You know, we have a great partnership with Border Patrol, but oftentimes they may be alone. Some of these stone garden details may just be state and local officers. You know, um, we would like to have a partnership at each one, but in the event that the troopers come across these crossings, they want to be able to enforce the law. Thank you so much, Mr. Quinn. Hopefully the Biden administration will come to their senses, and I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Tanadar, for his five minutes of question. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning. Uh, just uh, a response to the gentlewoman from Georgia and her comments about the infrastructure bill. I want to point out that the infrastructure bill funds 20 modernization projects at ports of entry. So I just want to say that for record, the truth. I would also like to show recent video footage of the Peace Bridge connecting the United States and Canada. As you can see, this is hardly the picture of disorder. My home state of Michigan is also a shining example of how efficient cross-border cooperation with Canada can benefit both our countries. Michigan exports approximately 21.7 billion in goods to Canada annually, including automobiles, pharmaceutical products, and natural gas. Every day, Thousands of people travel across the bridges that connect our countries, and I'm pleased to note that CBP has invested in new infrastructure to facilitate this trade and travel with the Gordiha International Bridge Project. Once this bridge is open next year, port of entry on both sides will allow for improved border processing and we couldn't have asked for a better partner than Canada, which contributed funding for a new inspection plaza. Dr. Dawson, my question is, can you speak to how investments in infrastructure, like the Gordie Ha International Bridge, help accelerate our critical trade relationship with Canada? Thank you, Mr. Thanadar. And let the, uh, I just wanted to, to uh, correct that even though I was born in Canada, I too am a gentlewoman of Georgia as I reside in Atlanta, <laughs> uh, which is also a major hub for direct flights back and forth to Canada and trade with Canada as well. So I, I agree heartily, investment in infrastructure is a great tool to propel uh, economic uh, development and prosperity in the United States. Uh, when you have, in the current uh, condition, a million dollars a minute going across the Ambassador Bridge between Detroit and Windsor, which is a, 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 an old piece of infrastructure that needs to be updated, um, that presents a lot of challenges because if you can't get folks across the border, uh, uh, it, rapidly, then you end up with trucks idling at the border. Terrible for admissions, terrible for business competitiveness if you can't get the willing buyer to the willing seller. Um, also, if you've got border congestion, you end up with cars and school buses and soccer teams in the same lineups as those trucks that are trying to get through. If you invest in infrastructure, you can spread folks out into the correct lanes and you can screen better for who might be a problem actor and who just needs to get to their soccer game or get to the GM plant. Now, for my home state of Michigan, the trade relationship with Canada is of vital importance. How can we support CBP's efforts to facilitate this trade while ensuring we maintain robust border security? Thank you. Um, the uh, CBP does a great job, and I really um, 
the, the remarks about robbing Peter to pay Paul, I agree entirely with that. Um, our CBP men and women are trying to do a lot and they, they need more, not just in terms of staffing and extra hours, but in terms of technology and the ability to deploy these technologies in infrastructure that allows that. Uh, we're not talking about replacing officers with technology, but rather giving them decision support tools so that they can uh, do their, their crossings easier, better, and also with an increased security um, uh, profile. Thank you, Dawson, Dr. Dawson, and thank you, the witnesses, for your testimony. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the vice chairman of the subcommittee, uh, the gentleman of Mississippi, Mr. Ezell. Thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss how the Biden administration's disastrous border policies have worsened the crisis at all of our borders, not just the southern border. The northern border is the longest border in the world, providing plenty of opportunities uh, for dangerous cartels to traffic illegal drugs and smuggle humans. Mr. Judd, as president of the National Border Patrol Council, you represent 16,000 brave Border Patrol agents who dedicate their lives to serving this nation. As a former law enforcement officer, I understand the difficulties our men and women in uniform have to face. Can you describe some of the challenges the Border Patrol agents facing at the northern border? Yeah, well, the, the main issue that we're dealing with right now is, is we just don't have the infrastructure technology nor the personnel that's necessary. Now, I'm not going to say that we need to uh, burden the taxpayer by giving us a lot more of the same tech type of technology that we, what we need on the southwest border, but I absolutely will say that we need to start with looking at what are the personnel that we have to have on the northern border, and then we can expand out from there. But until we do that, we're just not going to maintain the control that we that we must have between the ports of entry. How, how some of these uh, challenges uh, uh, curtail some of your uh, ability to recruit and retain, retain agents? Well, when, when you look at what's going on on the southwest border, it all starts there. Uh, when, when you look at the United States Border Patrol, nobody figured that, that what happened in Florida was going to take place. Um, nobody anticipated that, that what, what is currently happening in Swanton, in Burke, um, was going to take place. Now, let me take that back. It's not that we didn't anticipate it. It was we just didn't prepare for it. And that was what, what, what is necessary. We have to look at and we have to project out and say, this is what our failings could be if we rob Peter to pay Paul. If we have our agents in doing processing of the southwest border, then we're not going to have control on the northern border. But it all starts there. It has to start on the southwest border. If we can get control of the southwest border, then we can control the northern border. We can control our coastal border borders as well. But it all starts on the southwest border. It's very dangerous crossing that northern border. The terrain is tough, temperatures below freezing. Why are some of these migrants choosing to go up there now? Uh, because of the ease of crossing. Um, when, when you look at if you can come into Canada without a visa and then just work your way down, uh, again, the, those individuals from the country of India, uh, within 13 days, they were on, on our northern border and intended to cross into the United States, and unfortunately, they hit a blizzard, and that, that's just, that, that's horrendous. When you talk to any Border Patrol agent, when they have to deal with the death that we currently see, I personally witnessed somebody take their last breath, and that will be with me for the rest of my life. Um, and and when, you, when you see that, and when you see the, 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 that there are simple solutions, but we just don't have the political will to implement those simple solutions. It's very frustrating, it's very upsetting to every single Border Patrol agent that there is. Thank you for that. I plan on working with the committee to address the problems that you've described. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Ramirez, for uh, five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman. <sighs> Well, for those of you that don't know, I am an American and I'm also a proud daughter of a woman who crossed the Southwest border 40 years ago. And I have to tell you that I've been sitting here with a little scorecard of the number of things that I've heard that almost directly say that my mother and asylum seekers are less than human. I've heard a member, a Republican member, talk about immigrants as an infestation, and another one call it an invasion. 
Mr. Arthur, you and your organization have frequently proposed and defended extreme anti-immigrant policies, such as the Trump administration's so-called zero tolerance policy, which resulted in thousands of children being taken from their parents at the border, hundreds of whom still have not been reunited. In fact, you called this cruel and inhumane policy, and I quote, absolutely crucial. You also referred to provisions and law meant to protect migrant children as, and I quote, loopholes, and quote, flaws, and argued for their elimination. Maybe this kind of awful rhetoric is to be expected from a witness representing an organization founded by an anti-immigrant racist white nationalist like John Tanton, but it should have no place before this committee. And then we have Mr. Judd, who has used media appearances to repeat the great replacement theory, tropes regularly pushed by hate groups. This kind of dangerous rhetoric has inspired a rising number of domestic terror incidents across the country in recent years. And all of this for a hearing about a non-existent crisis along a shared border with our friend, our ally, and partner, Canada. So I want to direct my question to you, Dr. Dawson. Since you have spent your career working on U.S.-Canada matters, I'm interested in your take on how the revised Safe Third Country Agreement will affect migration along our northern border. As part of the agreement, Canada has agreed to take 15,000 migrants from the Western Hemisphere this year. Briefly, can you tell me a little bit about the U.S. and Canada and how this important issue is being carried on? Thank you. The U.S. and Canada are very closely aligned on uh, hemispheric migration issues, and I think our leaders look at the humanitarian elements very strongly. Uh, the recently uh, renegotiated or revised Safe Third Country Agreement um, is a way to impose greater rule of law. It was really a loophole that meant that uh, folks would be turned away um, if they came to the border post, but if they walked across the border and get, got arrested in Canada, they would have the opportunity to uh, sort of park in Canada for up to 24 months while they waited for their asylum claim to be adjudicated. It, it wasn't a guaranteed you get to live in Canada forever, but it was a way to uh, uh, spend time in Canada. And for folks who are, are fleeing desperate circumstances, it's totally understandable. But it was not uh, a situation that Canadians, or Americans, but Canadians, uh, found tolerable for the most part because of the equity issue. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of people who are displaced in the world. Many asylum seekers are doing all the right things, following all the right rules, and are languishing in refugee camps around the world. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. And I want to follow up on that, particularly from a place of equity. What role, if any, does the Future Borders Coalition see itself taking on addressing and eradicating some of the racial implicit bias that we see in facial recognition technology, given that the technology is a key recommendation in the organization's 2022 Path Towards Border Digitation Report. But we know that there's racial bias in face technology, and we've seen that particularly with Haitian and African um, asylum seekers. Thank you for that question. Uh, our organization has been engaged uh, uh, with US CBP and with Canada CBSA on the very issue of demographic bias in facial recognition technology. We have spoken to them and are learning how the technology is being improved, how it is being tested, uh, and that the, the uh, opportunities for demographic bias are shrinking. They are not nothing, but they are shrinking. And so we recommend uh, facial recognition uh, technologies only as we have the assurance that they are secure and we have public trust in their use. Thank you, I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Minutes. I'd like to yield one minute to Mr. Arthur to respond to some of the attacks that were directed his way, if that'd be appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Strong, and I do appreciate that. One, I disagree with uh, almost everything that the honorable woman said. 
The Center for Immigration Studies was founded by Otis Graham, who is a professor at the University of California, San Diego. On our board of directors, we have the first Hispanic uh, U.S. attorney from San Diego. We have the former executive director for the Congressional Black Caucus, who was also the former graduate dean at Morgan State University in the home state of uh, Mr. Ivey and I. Uh, and we also have the president of the Urban League of Miami. With respect to uh, uh, families and family units and the separation policy, it was poorly handled. But in an uh, April 2019 report, a bipartisan uh, panel of the Homeland Security Advisory Committee found that those children are being used as pawns and that they're all traumatized on the trip to the United States. With respect to unaccompanied alien children, I believe the, Wall the Washington Post editorial board may have used the word loophole to refer to the TVPRA as well. I can't remember if they did, but they certainly alluded to it. Um, but in June of 2014 in uh, Guatemala, President Biden talked about how all of those, how those kids are being placed in the hands of criminals to be smuggled to the United States who physically and sexually assault them. If you took all of the children who have been uh, released into the United States under the Biden administration, put them all in one school district, it would be the sixth largest in the United States. If you had a school district in which there were a significant number of physical and sexual assaults going on every day, that would be the only thing, God, I pray, that this committee and every committee on Capitol Hill would be looking at every day. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Arthur. Uh, Mr. Judd, I'd like to say thank you for the time that you've spent with us. Um, I'm in my first 11 weeks as a United States Congressman. It's been very informative. Uh, the thing that we saw at the southern border, I've been there twice since I've been a United States Congressman. They're not just coming from Mexico. They're coming from Honduras, Guatemala, Cuba, El Salvador, Haiti, Iran, and they're coming from uh, China, too. Mr. Arthur, um, we often hear every uh, migrant that comes to our border referred to as an asylee. However, does DHS admit that uh, of all the people subject to expedited removal who claim fear between 2014 and 2019, only 15% of their asylum claims uh, were ever actually granted? Yeah, it's actually 14.7%. Actually, I think it was 17% of all the uh, people, but that was 14.7% uh, or 14% 14 of 83%. It's a little confusing. But yeah, uh, a significant number of individuals past credible fear uh, are allowed to apply for asylum. And yet during that 12-year period, we saw that nearly, uh, it was almost twice as likely that a migrant would uh, be ordered uh, removed in absentia when they failed to appear at their hearings than that they were actually granted asylum. Thank you. You're an immigration judge and have studied and translated the data. Is it your opinion that the uh, migrants pouring over the border, particularly the northern border, are all asylees? Uh, you know, it's actually interesting, Mr. Strong, because in my written testimony, I talk about uh, Canadian officials, Canadian NGO officials who are talking about our system was never built to handle this many asylees. At the end of 2022, there were 70,000 and change asylees in Canada, a period of time in which there were 1.566 million in the United States. I was an immigration judge. I granted people asylum. Uh, it's absolutely important that we keep the asylum system. We be able to grant people asylum. Thank this you. is been, breaking the asylum system. Thank Mr. you. It's been reported that President Biden and Pri uh, Prime Minister Trudeau have reached an agreement to apply the Canada-U.S. Safe Third Country Agreement to illegal aliens that have crossed um, in between the borders. Will this modification act as a deterrent, or is it more smoke and mirrors from the Biden administration? It's a strong uh, protective measure for uh, the Canadian government because the Canadian government was inundated 40,000 people came through the Wrexham Road unofficial board of, uh, port of entry in 2022 into Canada. Um, so this really just benefits uh, Canada. It doesn't benefit the United States. Canada has three oceans surrounding it, and there are only borders with the United States. The only illegal migration that they get primarily, almost exclusively, is across that border into uh, Canada. Thank you. Ms. Dawson, in January of 2023, there are numerous reports of at least one Canadian providence that voted to decriminalize the possession of hard drugs, cocaine, heroin, fentanyl, along with others. Ms. Dawson, what does your data show will occur in the next 10 years when many uh, in Canada uh, believe the solution is to uh, legalize cocaine, heroin, fentanyl? Uh, what do you think this is going to do? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's not something that I have the data to, to answer. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, Canada has different rules uh, with respect to, to many things as a sovereign state, uh, uh, use of drugs uh, among them. But I can tell you that the U.S. and Canada do cooperate extensively on uh, cross-border movement uh, uh, of, uh, of criminals, uh, eradication. There's a cross-border crime forum that's looking at these issues every single day, and I recommend that you, know, you look to the cross-border crime forum to make sure that uh, this issue is high on their priority list. Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back and uh, now recognize the uh, final member of the committee, of the subcommittee to, uh, to ask questions before we reach the, uh, the guests. Uh, that's Mr. Crane of Arizona for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, appearing here today uh, before our committee. Um, it, it's true that you guys are under oath. Is that correct? Did yes, I? sir. All right. Uh, Ms. Dawson, my first question for you, for you. Um, what's, uh, what's better, ham or Canadian bacon? <laughs> We're on the clock, Ms. Dawson. I, I have no answer. I have no okay. answer. I All have right. no answer. I can't say that Montreal bagels are better, though. Okay. All right. Moving on to uh, Mr. Judd. Mr. Judd, it's good to see you. I don't know which one of us brought the warm weather from Arizona, but it is nice up here. Mr. Judd, how many years have you uh, been an agent? 25, but I, I'd first like to start. I, I, I'm amazed that a member of Congress can actually impugn somebody's in, um, character without letting that individual answer the question. She said that I repeated uh, white nationalist tropes, when in reality, all I did was repeated what John D. Podesta said. John D. Podesta's think tank said, demographics, I believe that this is a direct quote, demographics is destiny. I had never heard of the great replacement theory until USA Today wrote a story on it. And it's amazing that a congresswoman can impugn somebody's character without even allowing them to answer. I've been a Border Patrol agent for 25 years. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you got to address that. And if you'd like to say anything else on my time, go for it. What else you got? Sorry about that. Now, um, how long have you been representing Border Patrol agents in the uh, National Border Patrol Council? I've been in a, in a position one or the other for about 15 years, approximately. Thank you, sir. Um, would you say you're proud of your job? And if I so, am. why? Very, very proud of my job. I think that it's very important for the safety and security of the American people. I think you told me a couple of years ago, sir, uh, the first time I ever met you, that your organization um, has endorsed candidates from both parties. Is that correct? We have. So would you say that your organization is bipartisan? It absolutely is. That's weird because that doesn't happen a lot up in this town. Can you elaborate on why your organization uh, is bipartisan? We'll work with anybody that wants to secure the border. That's, that's what we want. We work to, to, for the safety and security of the American people. Any law enforcement, when they put on a uniform, what they want to do is they want to protect citizens. And that's what we want to do. And we'll work with anybody that will work with us. Thank you, sir. Uh, would you agree with Secretary Mayorkas' assessment that we have, a op we have operational control at the southern border? Absolutely not. Um, can you briefly describe some of the most detrimental policy changes that current administration has put into place? When you look at the, the main magnet that draws people to cross our borders illegally is whether or not they're going to be released into the United States. Right now, nearly everybody that crosses the border illegally, if they're not expelled under Title 42, which is only about 30 percent right now, then they're released into the United States. That's the main magnet that, that, that drives people. And he has, he has put that, if, if you will, he's put that on steroids. Yeah. Does it bother you on a personal level to see these uh, changes uh, made? It does, because it, I know that we can't properly protect the American people with these policies. Yeah, one of the things that was covered earlier, sir, was uh, the attrition rate in the Border Patrol. In your professional um, and longstanding position in the Border Patrol, do you think that has anything to do with Border, Patri Border Patrol agents feeling like no, it doesn't even matter what they it, do. It does. I speak with agents on a regular basis that, that are leaving the agency because they know that they can't do the job that they, that they wanted to do. That's got to be kind of heartbreaking to somebody who's, you know, devoted so much of your time and life, sacrificed time away from your family to protecting American citizens. It is. Yeah. Um, sir, do you know when uh, President Biden's first visit to the border was? Was it January 23rd? It was, yes. Yep. So how, how many years into his presidency was that, sir? And, uh, just over two years. Do you know how many? Do you know how many trips uh, President Trump made to the border, Mr. Judd? I, I don't know exactly, but I know that he made multiple trips. 
Yeah, we were looking it up this morning. I think it was a, about five. Yeah. Um, do you think it has, as a leader yourself, do you think it has anything to do um, with leadership um, if you actually show up to the places that you represent and the people that uh, follow you see you show up? Yeah, I any time that you know that, that somebody supports what you're doing, what your mission is, you're, you're going to be a lot more energized to do the job. Awesome. Mr. Arthur, my last question is for you. Uh, my colleague over here from Michigan, Mr. Uh, Thanator, showed a video of some vehicles going over a bridge um, in Michigan and then stated that this is hardly a picture of disorder. And I, I asked a couple other members if, if they got the same implication that I did that, hey, doesn't really, because of the video I'm showing where cars are going over a border and trucks are going over a border, there's no issue here. When you saw that, what did you think about? What did you think about that example that he made in the video that he showed? Do you think that that described the border issues that we have going on here in the United States, sir? Well, actually, uh, the interesting thing is that the conclusion that I drew from that talks about why this important this hearing today was so important. We need to listen to Dr. Dawson, the ranking member, talked about the importance of trade between the United States and Canada. We need to continue that relationship. Our relationship with Canada. Uh, is absolutely crucial to our vitality, our economic vitality. I know that the time is up. I'll make it short. We need to make sure that that continues. I was in, not this building, but two dip buildings down on September 11th. Uh, and everything changed that way, certainly changed. I, had, I was oversight counsel for immigration. Um, the dangers that we would have to shut down our economy, shut down our borders, shut down our commerce because something had happened, we're real. Mr. Uh, o, sir, I was asking about a specific video. You know, I understand that. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna, I real mean, quick, real quick, I'm going to go to Mr. Judd. Mr. I'm Judd, sorry. when you watch that video. Uh, it, point, it, point of order. I, I, the gentleman's time's expired. Okay. All right. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and, uh, and uh, we were, we're blessed to have uh, – several strong guest members here. And so uh, uh, at this time, I yield to uh, Mr. Correa, recognize Mr. Correa for five minutes of question. Thank you, Chairman Bishop. And I want to thank you for holding this hearing on the northern border. We do have to look at all points of entry to this country and see how things, the state of how things are. Uh, in preparation for this hearing, I called the Canadian ambassador to the United States uh, Christine Hillman to ask her about what she thought about this hearing. And um, she reminded me of some very important facts. Number one, Canada is our biggest trading partner. Number two, Canada is our strongest security partner in the world. The only nation that we have a joint military command with, it's called NORAD. Mr. Arthur, you talked about 911. Canada was there for us to protect us when 911 happened. They had the aftermath. Absolutely, were sir. The RCAF uh, took place, took part. Thank you, thank oh, you. Sorry. Not a question, just state me, boss. Canada also fought with us in every major war in this last century: World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan. Just recently, the administration announced a new agreement with Canada to address the issue of refugees. Because refugees is not a U.S. issue, not a Canadian issue, not a Mexican issue. It's a regional issue. The solution is going to demand all of us working together. Dr. Dawson, would you use the word disorder to characterize what's going on at the Canadian border? No, uh, sir, I would not. And thank you for bringing so many of the, the great relationship facts to the table today. You know, Democrats passed an infrastructure bill, included 26 major modernization of land ports of entry, 20 of these in the northern border. I've been going to the southern border all my life. I was in San Isidro recently, spoke to Mr. Jada, a lot of your members who told me the investments we made in that infrastructure in San Isidro transformed that port of entry, probably the biggest in the world. Order, processing, efficiency. 2023 fiscal year funding bill, 
125 additional CBP officers, 300 additional Border Patrol agents. You're absolutely right. It's not enough, but it's better than zero. And the big issue is not the funding, as you know. It's finding qualified agents because of the rigorous standards that are there in place. And I'm working, hopefully with a lot of folks here, to address those requirements so we can get folks hired. Dr. Dawson, do you believe infrastructure, personnel, technology, which Democrats passed bills for over the last two years, will streamline commerce and help process folks at border entries? Yes, absolutely. And I just want to underscore that these are not distinct, that security and prosperity are interlinked. And if you if get you've got your right, biggest you partner to the north and your second largest trading partner to the south, you got to have both of them going together. I want to show you a picture of Roxham Road. This was sent to me by U.S. Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz. This is the largest irregular crossing point along the U.S.-Canada border. With a vast majority of traffic, human drugs and weapons crossing into Canada from the United States. That's right, crossing into Canada from the United States. I'm gonna show you irregular crossing. Does this look like chaos? Finally, in my last 45 seconds here, let me say that the ambassador also pointed out another issue to me. The ambassador said to me, Lou, irregular crossing, there was a spike because the US was requiring COVID vaccine and COVID tests to enter the United States. And people in Canada didn't have those things, so they resorted to irregular crossings. Um, Finally, my question to you, Dr. Dawson, is a uh, recent agreement between the U.S. and Canada passed last few days ago. Does this benefit Canada or is this a win-win agreement? This is a win-win. Thank you for the question. This is a win-win, and it's one part of a multi-pronged, I don't even know if it's a solution, but efforts to mitigate a humanitarian crisis. Uh, safe third country agreement helps to provide a greater amount of law and order to uh, uh, asylum seeking processing. Canada also agreed to accept a larger number of Western Hemisphere uh, asylum seekers. There's also the Los Angeles Declaration, which was signed at the Summit of Mr. the Americas Chair, if I may, in 2022. Three seconds. I guess. Dr. Dasman is looking Mr. Correa, for I, I did enforce on Mr. Crane earlier at the instance of the ranking member. I hate to cut you off, but I certainly appreciate the uh, appreciate Thank you your being Chair. here, my friend. Your time. And uh, with that, uh, I'm honored to recognize the chairman of the Republican Conference and member from New York, uh, Ms. Stefanik, for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Dawson, have you been to the Swanton sector of the northern border? Yes, quite often. Have you? T where have you been? Um, I was a resident of, of Ottawa, so Ontario, so I was up and down the upstate New York and New England area very frequently, especially along the lakes. Have you spoken with Border Patrol officers in upstate New York or the North Country? I have not spoken to Border Patrol officers recently from that area, no. Well, I will tell you, I speak to Border Patrol officers all the time in my district. I represent 700,000 uh, hardworking Americans that live in my district, and it is an abject disaster what is happening at our southern border and the impact it's having on our northern border. Dr. Dawson, are you aware that encounters at the northern border have surged up to 846% in the Swanton sector that you are so familiar with? I think during my testimony earlier, I uh, indicated that... Are you aware of 846%? That is not a number that uh, I'm... So you disagree with that number put out by the U.S. government? I don't have the information to agree or disagree. Okay, well, that is the number. Mr. Judd, because you are familiar with, Nor with Northern Border Patrol officers, because I know you speak to them regularly, as I do in my district, I want to get your input. Do we have operational control over the northern border? No, we don't. In fact, what, what happens is we conflate the issue. We conflate uh, the ports of entry, and between the ports of entry, we have to subtract out the two. In fact, that's the reason why we have two different agencies that work. You have the, the port of entry, which is the, the Office of Field Operations, and then you have between the ports of entry, uh, which is the Border Patrol. We have to take those two issues apart from each other and look at them individually. 
And Mr. Judd, walk me through, I'm very familiar hearing from my constituents about the crisis on the southern border, how that has impacted the morale of Border Patrol officers up north who have been transferred over and over again to the southern border with no notice deployments. Number one, the morale impact, and number two, the fact that we do not have the personnel we need operationally along the northern border, specifically the Swanton sector. A little over 25 years, I've never seen the morale lower in the Border Patrol than what it is today. Um, make no mistake, we will continue to put on the uniform. We will continue to go out and do the job that we're, we're supposed to do. We just won't be happy about the job that we're, that, that we're doing because we know that we do not have the support of this administration to actually protect the American people. And then when you look at how we have taken away from the northern border to support the southwest border, it, always st it all starts on the south southwest border. If we can control the southwest border, then we won't have to touch the northern border agents. But because we don't have the policy that's necessary to secure the southwest border, then the northern border gets, gets robbed and then it opens up the gaps that we're currently seeing. We know when we had a secure border in this country, it was not that long ago, what tools or policies were taken away by the Biden administration that led to this crisis on both the southern and northern border? It was actually the re-implementation of a tool, which was what we call catch and release. When you look at under President Trump, we got rid of catch and release. And when you get rid of catch and release, when you get rid of the promise that you're going to reward people for violating our laws, they're going to stop coming. We saw that under President Trump. Once that was re-implemented, that's why we saw the huge increase. Increase. If they know, if, if individuals know that they can violate our laws and be rewarded for violating our laws, of course it's going to happen. Uh, my additional question is, you are all familiar, the Biden administration and Secretary Mayorkas have repeatedly claimed they have operational control of the southern border, something that the chief of the Border Patrol recently disputed in a hearing. Mr. Quinn, do you believe that we have operational control over the southern and northern border? I can only speak to my border, and I don't believe we do. We have 58 miles of border in New Hampshire. I was at the Swanton sector on Friday. I know that they are working very hard to the west, so I'm concerned with our 58 miles. What are the resources that are there 24-7 um, in the event that somebody called and it was an issue of an illegal crossing, whether Doc it's through 911 or however? Dr. Dawson, in your, uh, since you be, seem to be an expert on the Swanton sector, even though you're unfamiliar with the 840% increase uh, that we've had in terms of encounters, do you believe that both the southern and northern border are, uh, we have operational control? Southern border. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Mr. Arthur. Uh, yeah, uh, I was there when this committee uh, drafted the Secure Fence Act of 2006 uh, under the definition set forth in Section 2 of that act. We don't have anything even approximating operational control. Again, as I said during my opening statement, I've never seen the border this bad in history. Well, that's the sentiment shared with Border Patrol officers, border families in my district, and I am proud to be one of the strongest advocates for U.S.-Canadian partnership, U.S.-Canadian trade. I co-chair the Northern Border Caucus, which is bipartisan, was one of the leading advocates for making sure we implemented USMCA. We want to continue to strengthen that partnership, not at the risk of having a strong security partnership and a partnership when it comes to securing our border. I'm very confident it is not a partisan issue in my district. This administration has absolutely failed, and it's because of their failures that have caused this crisis on both the southern and north northern border. With that, I yield back. The gentleman, gentlelwoman yields back, and I now re uh, recognize uh, the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Clark, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our ranking member. I thank our panelists of witnesses here today. Uh, my first question is for uh, Dr. Dawson. Dr. Dawson, the U.S.-Canada border separates two friendly and collaborative nations very similar to what my uh, colleague, Mr. Correa, shared with you. And, and we have a long history of social, cultural, and economic ties. As a matter of fact, I have two aunts living in Toronto. Uh, this relationship was on full display last week with President Biden, when President Biden met with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to announce a historic new agreement on managing migration between our two nations. The agreement ensures that our countries can return migrants who come uh, between parts of uh, ports of entry and includes a promise for, uh, from Canadians to accept 15,000 migrants from the Western Hemisphere this year. Dr. Dawson, 
How will you, how will this new agreement address irregular migration and better secure the northern border? So the new agreement, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. The new agreement will help to ensure that uh, asylum seekers and people who see opportunities in, uh, to, to, to settle in the U.S. and Canada don't take advantage of a system that is in, uh, uh, intended to help the very, you know, the mo people who are most in need. There is an established uh, asylum seeking uh, process that, that exists in the world. The U.S. has recently taken measures to expedite asylum seeking, uh, and, and we applaud that. And so the changes to the safe, uh, safe Third Country Agreement really help to impose a greater level of lawfulness, rule of law on that border. But really what we're talking about is how we can secure our perimeter. We are friends, we are neighbors, and the folks who mean us harm are coming from the outside. So we, many of them are coming from the outside. So we need to uh, collaborate together to ensure uh, strong perimeter security, not bigger border walls or bigger barriers between us. I thank you. We've heard a lot today about an increase in migrant activity along the northern border. And I'd like to point out something obvious that I don't think my Republican colleagues uh, seem intent uh, to, to, to sort of gloss over. From March 2020 to October 2022, the Canadian border was effect effectively closed due to COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. And while there were still some crossings, comparing the numbers that we're seeing today, well, well into post-pandemic reopening to the numbers we were seeing just last year or the year before at best, it is at best disingenuous and misleading. In fact, when we drill down into the number of apprehensions that Border Patrol has made between ports of entry, we find that they actually hit a high water mark in fiscal year 2019 under President Trump with 4,408 apprehensions compared to 2,856 encounters the Border Patrol has had in fiscal year 2023. This is hardly an out of control crisis, but you know. Dr. Dawson, can you describe how CBP has worked with Canadian officials to facilitate the reopening of the U.S.-Canada border following the lifting of the COVID pandemic restrictions? Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, CBP and CBSA officers work together every single day and are in constant communication on, on operational issues, challenges, etc. They have uh, reopened our Nexus Enrollment Centers, which is part of the Global Access Trusted Trader Program. Uh, they're working together on things like the Shiprider Program, uh, on uh, bilateral issues related to child sexual exploitation and screening out the traffickers uh, uh, who, who move uh, between our two countries. Uh, there are more problems and there are solutions, but CBSA and CBP are dedicated to um, finding, finding uh, answers to joint challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Dawson. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for um, the time. And let me just say that I think um, you know, it's time that we get beyond performance art and get to comprehensive immigration reform. That, you know, we need to look at this in a holistic manner. Um, and the, the steady drumbeat of, um, you know, uh, what I would consider to be um, issues that uh, don't get us to that point does not solve the problem. So with, th with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I, and I thank you once again. I thank the gentlewoman for, gentlewoman for appearing. I, I will say that I wish she had been with us uh, in uh, McAllen to hear the uh, chief of the Border Patrol say that we don't have operational control of the southern border, uh, that the border is not secure, and that it's the cause by the Biden administration's policies. That was, we, we all have an opportunity to learn from things. But, and with that, uh, I uh, uh, recognize my friend from Texas, the general lady, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes of questioning. I thank the chairman and the ranking member, and. Um, uh, I uh, joined with my uh, colleague and friend from New York, uh, Ms. Clark, on the number of iterations that we've had uh, since uh, my tenure on this committee, which is more than two decades, uh, to be able to really get to the serious work of immigration reform and 
working together to secure our borders. Uh, for every trip that I may have missed to my friend uh, from North Carolina, uh, I think I have literally lived at the border at every crisis uh, that there have been. I'm from Texas, and I know the border very well. Mr. Judd, let me thank you for 25 years, and I think we've been on this Homeland Security journey almost the same amount of time. Um, you uh, started a little bit before 9-11. Uh, of course, you know we created the Homeland Security uh, Department uh, and, of course, um, excuse my voice, and also the Homeland Security Committee. I'm very proud to have had under our jurisdiction uh, the Border Patrol, of which I've known almost all of the leaders and your counsel as well. Just, just a question, Mr. Judd. Um, would a decrease in funding uh, for the Border Patrol and border needs uh, be of help in any way? No, Decreasing the funding? No, it would not. Thank you. Um, I'm committed uh, to making sure uh, that as we proceed in appropriations, I'm on the authorizing this committee that we work very hard uh, to ensure funding uh, for the needs of our Border Patrols, our CBP, some of the physical infrastructure. I was at the board, uh, Brownsville just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, crossed over the border, as I often do, and um, I see uh, the continuing need. So let me put that on the record, um, first of all. Uh, and let me put on the record as well that our Republican friends uh, who are here in this committee are part of the effort uh, to fund the discretionary funding, which is Border Patrol, Homeland Security at 2019 funding. That would be a sizable seismic cut uh, to the needs of our nation. Uh, let me count myself uh, as a um, strong fighter and opponent uh, to that, along with the Biden administration. But let me also uh, try to clarify very quickly before I raise questions with um, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the witnesses. Um, this is a straw man on this 100% operational control. Even the former Homeland Security Chairman, Mr. McCall, on May 15, 2013, during the markup of H.R. 1417, the Border Security Results Act of 2013, shows I've been on this committee for a very long time. We have defined operational control in this bill based on the oversight work of the committee. It is a reflection of testimony from the Chief of the Border Patrol, a 90% standard for success. Over all administrations, we've never gone beyond 70 to 75 percent. Doesn't mean we don't need to continue to achieve, uh, because I'm reminded that it was Border Patrol and FBI that saved us in 9-11, not 9-11, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the uh, turn of the century uh, when a terrorist was caught at the border. It was the northern border, and it was through the law enforcement work of all of you, uh, Border Patrol, FBI, uh, that we were saved in terms of the northern border. So let's be more accurate in our assessment. Let, let me go to Dr. Dorson. Um, how does the irregular uh, migration into the United States over the northern border compare to irregular migration uh, into Canada? Isn't it true that most weapons and people move north, not south? How is the cooperation on this um, combating this journey of the irregular migration? Did you hear me? My voice is a little bit. Sorry, really, the, the percentage in Canada is, is minuscule compared to the southern border. But as, as I said in my testimony, this is not nothing, and this is something that we do have to continue to deal with. Um, it is both an enforcement problem, but it's also a root causes issue, and we need to work together to uh, provide options for asylum seekers, options for folks that are in crisis, and regularized migration uh, throughout the hemisphere. Let me also ask, because I just get in before the chairman gavels me, we've had a lot, uh, uh, heard a lot about uh, the people and drugs coming into the United States over the northern border. Um, and we understand, however, that only one pound of fentanyl has, um, has been uh, uh, found on the northern border this year. Is that true? That's my understanding as well, one pound uh, is this year, yes. Okay, so um, let's get the correct narrative. We should be working together, but we shouldn't put up straw men or false information about uh, what is transpiring. We know we don't want fentanyl here from any border, but what I hope you're saying is that we can get this 
done by working together, including the agreement that the president just signed with the president of Canada? That's yes. exactly what I'm saying, ma'am. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. And uh, I thank the witnesses for your valuable testimony and your answers. I thank the members for their attendance and questions. Members of the subcommittee might have additional questions for you in writing. If they do, we'd ask you to respond to those in writing. And uh, pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be open for 10 days for that purpose. Without objection, subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.